So I think I'll use Overcome the World. In a Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown goes into a wind-up on the pitcher's mound. In order to fortify his confidence, he quotes scripture. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the pestilence that walketh in noonday. In the next frame, wham! The ball comes zooming back toward the, 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 the pitcher's mound, catapulting Charlie Brown over head over heels. In the last frame, we see him lying face down on the ground with stars dancing around his head, and he concludes, but those lying drives will kill you. Many stories of courageous uh, uh, compassion uh, have come out of this pandemic event. Heroes like a 14-year-old boy saying, I want to do something uh, in this, in this uh, environment, this uh, coronavirus environment. He, he, he said, you know what? He said, I'm, I'm going to offer myself and my bicycle to deliver groceries to the elderly. Wasn't that wonderful? Uh, just exceptional people doing exceptional things because of this virus. I, I'm so proud of, of the doctors and, and of the nurses and those that work in the hospitals and sacrifice themselves and sometimes their families to take care of others. I, I appreciate my wife so very much who also works in the hospital and, and goes in there day after day uh, 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 in, in a dangerous environment police and firemen and employees in our supermarkets and, and those uh, food preparers that uh, are fixing the food for carryout. No, this is not an easy world that we live in. Sometimes it, it's a cruel world, and, and uh, even for people who are trying to do good. My son, who works in the Walmart up in Ohio, uh, he's kind of uh, a, a, a manager over a, a couple of the departments in the in the Walmart, and uh, he he and all those people in that Walmart are just risking their health uh, to be there for for those of us that have needs. And uh, but anyway, I, I I was talking to him the other day, and he said, Dad, uh, when it comes my turn to be on the door, and he said that's about once or twice a week. He said that that's the worst part of this job. He said because people that uh, uh, that are standing there in line waiting to get in uh, or or he said at closing time when when we're we're shutting the doors he said and people want to force their way in he said they just absolutely want to hit you and 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 uh, they threaten you and he said it, it's just terrible he said the way people act and well you know sometimes we can understand why uh, why people act that way but uh, really and truly, uh, there's no cause for it. Uh, he he said that it just scares me, and uh, and uh, he said I, I just don't understand people. Well, you know what? Love can overcome this this feeling and this this uh, uh, this fear that we have of this of this pandemic thing that's going on. Uh, in in First Corinthians uh, thirteen four, uh, you read these words. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not proud. Love is not rude. Is not selfish and does not get upset with others. Love does not count up wrongs and, uh, that have been done. Love takes no pleasure in evil but rejoices over the truth. Love patiently accepts all things. It always trusts, always hopes, and always endures. Love. Love, love is powerful. Love, love is experienced in, in many ways, including uh, the love of forgiveness and love of kindness and love for justice and, and love finds the best in people. Love does not allow for jealousy and envy and pride and selfishness. God showed how much he loved us. First of all, it was love that brought Jesus Christ into the world. It's not so much that we loved him, but the Bible says it's the fact that he loved us. He loved us. I don't know how many of you are readers, but uh, many years ago, James Michener uh, put out a book that was probably a top seller, and it was called Hawaii. And you remember an old man contracts leprosy. Uh, uh, this is back in the 1850s. And, and you already know from the Bible, leprosy is a disease that was unclean and 
it separated you from society, kind of like we're separated now. Thank God it's not leprosy, but like we're separated now. And the same thing in Hawaii then, uh, you were isolated to a leper colony, separated from your family, and you were sent to an isolated island, island. Uh, but in James Michener's novel, this leprous man's wife kneels before him and offers herself to be his kakua, kakua. Now I'm going to explain to you what kakua means. Healthy persons willing to commit to, commit to staying and with and nursing a leprous person. They, they, they offer to move to that island with this leprous person and take care of them as long as they live. They become that person's kukua. It, you know, it, like self-sacrifice. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. Self-sacrifice. You remember he said, they don't take my life from me. I'm, I'm laying my life down on my own for the world and the, and the salvation of the world. And Jesus kind of becomes our kakua. Thus, in this message that, that, that uh, uh, in the message, the, that uh, Gospel of John 3, 16, 17 explains it very well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He did not come into the world to condemn the world, but he came into the world to save the world, to save the world. We were not saved by our own hand. We were saved by the love and the power uh, of, uh, poured out on Calvary. It was, it was a love that brought Christ to you and me. And secondly, it was love that supported the Christian in the small group in that darkest hour. You remember in Acts when they all gathered in the upper room, 120 in an upper room, surrounded by the whole Roman Empire, thousands and thousands and thousands of Romans who were their enemies, but they could not break them of their relationship with Christ. There were only 120 of them, but uh, the, the thousands couldn't break them. They, they ate together. They prayed together. They sang together. You know, that's what I miss about church. You know, we eat together. We sing together. We pray together. We cry together. We laugh together. It's just a joy being together, and I truly miss that, and I know that most of you do too. But when people love and support each other, like those 120 in the upper room, nothing, nothing can break them. Nothing can break them. The church has been, in a sense, shut down for several weeks. I know that. But my friend, that's only a representation of the real church. This building is only a representation of the real church. The real church is you and I. Those that know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that's the real church, and that's not been shut down and never will be shut down. I long for our church to reopen. I, I miss you people. I miss your your presence. I miss your laughter. I miss your, uh, your stories. I, I just miss being personally with you. Uh, and I'm, I'll be glad when we start back up again. But uh, but uh, we're, we haven't given up. There's no way that we can be overcome. Jesus Christ, uh, when he abides in your heart and life, he does that for, for as long as you're here. Amen? It's the love that gives us hope for tomorrow. There are times in life when we are kind of helpless like Charlie Brown. We have experienced one of those hard drives that knocks us off of the pitcher's mound, and we we turn uh, and we turn where everyone must turn sooner or later. We throw ourselves on the mercy of God, and and if God should be there, shouldn't be there, uh, we are in a pitiful situation. There's a story of an unknown author being circulated on the internet that reflects the uh, uh, the uh, outlook of of John 17. It's, it's about a little boy who's about to have heart surgery. And, uh, the, the surgeon is visiting the room, and he said, Tomorrow, uh, I'll, open your, I'll open your heart. And the little boy said, Yes, you'll open my heart, and you'll find Jesus there. The surgeon looked up, kind of annoyed. I'll cut open your heart, son, he continued to see how much damage has been done. But when you cut open my heart, said the little boy, you'll find Jesus in there. The surgeon looked to the parents who sat quietly. When I see how much damage has been done, I'll sew 
your heart and your chest back up, and, and I'll plan what to do next. But you'll find Jesus in my heart, the young boy said. The Bible says he lives there. He, he, he lives there all the time. Uh, you'll find him in my heart. The surgeon had had enough. I tell you what I'll find in your heart, he said coldly. I'll find damaged muscles, low blood supply, and weakened vessels, and I'll find out if you can, if I can make you well. And Jesus will too, the young fellow answered. He lives there. The surgeon left, aggravated, sat in his office, recording his notes from surgery, damaged aorta, damaged pulmonary vein, widespread muscle degeneration, no hope for transplant, no hope for cure. Therapy, painkillers, and bed rest, prognosis. Here he paused, death within one year. He stopped the recorder, but there was more to be said. Why, he asked aloud. It was clear that he was speaking to God. Why did you do this? You put him here. You you put him in this pain. You you've cursed him with an early death. Why? The surgeon's tears were hot, but his anger was harder. You created that boy, and you created the heart. He'll be dead in months. Why? And thus a dialogue began between the surgeon and God. And in that dialogue, this frustrated physician discovered a new understanding of God's providence and love. The surgeon sat at his desk and wept. Now he sat beside the boy's bed. The boy's parents sat across from him. The boy awoke and whispered, Did you cut open my heart? Yes, said the surgeon. What did you find, asked the boy. I found Jesus Christ there, he said. In times of persecution and suffering, in times of grief and stress, when all it comes down when it all comes down to it, we have only one place to turn, and that's to the power of the indwelling Christ who lives in our hearts and our lives. If there's not at the heart of the universe a heart of love, then nothing else matters really. 1 Corinthians 13 says, fervent, fervent love for one another, fervently love one another from the heart. This is the ultimate secret of the Christian love. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three. But the Bible says the greatest of these is love. God's love for us, not our love for God, but his love for us. Jesus said in John 17, 26, I showed them what you are like, and I will show them again. Then they will have the same love that you have for me, and I will love, and I will love in them. My prayer for you and my prayer for everyone is that Jesus is living in your heart. Thank you. Have a good week. Push, push.